Hello and a very warm welcome to Conversations in Craft. I'm Becky Metcalf, Head of Content at Design Centre Chelsea Harbour. The Design Centre supports creative expression across the design agenda and today's virtual session is particularly apt as it coincides with the opening of Artifact, our first new contemporary craft fair. With craft making its mark on interior design, Artifact will be an opportunity to discover, learn, connect and gain a greater understanding of how one-of-a-kind designs are conceived and made. Broadening specialist knowledge, this series will offer insider insights from the craft industry's leading lights and we're bringing together renowned experts from gallerists to makers and curators for some great conversation, both physically and online. For this virtual session, I'm simply delighted to introduce Jay Blades, presenter, modern furniture restorer and upcycler. And who better to moderate the session than writer and podcaster Grant Gibson. Over to you, Grant. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hello and welcome to the first of two digital talks I'm doing for the new gallery-led contemporary craft fair, Artifact, which runs from the 22nd to the 29th of June at London's Design Centre Chelsea Harbour. My name is Grant Gibson. I'm a writer, editor and host of the podcast Material Matters, and it gives me huge pleasure to be spending the next 40 minutes or so chatting to the modern furniture restorer, upcycler, eco-designer, and of course, presenter of TV shows such as Money for Nothing and the repair shop, Jay Blades. Jay, thank you very much for doing this. Really appreciate it. No problem at all. No problem at all, Grant. Um, that's an intro, isn't it? God blimey, I've not, I haven't heard myself being intro before. But that's, <laughs> that's quite nice. I like hey, well, you're normally doing the introductions, right? So, uh, so it's my turn. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> first question is, it's kind of the obvious one, really, but how's the lockdown been for you? How's the pandemic panned out? I do, I do, I do, pandemic has been quite good in the sense that I've, I've worked quite a lot. Um, filmed, I think last year I filmed about seven shows and this year I'm doing, I think, about eight, I think. Um, but it, I know for a lot of people it's been really, really bad, but a lot of the shows that I film are to boost up morale yeah. so basically the bbc just kind of went into overdrive um and the, we've done like a lot of social distancing so the recording has been very um it's been very different normally you have a crew of people now you've got a really skeleton staff it's just you and a person and that's it um mm. so it's been interestingly different will that change the way you make television going forward i wonder i think it it won't because, especially the shows I do, the shows are very um, touchy feely. So you like to shake people's hands, give people a hug, mm. hand someone some tissue when they're crying. Um, it's we as humans are very tactile, so we, we like to touch each other. It's just the way we communicate. I think they say fifty percent of our fifty seven percent, sorry, of our communication is body language. Yeah. So that's a whole load of gestures, and if you've got a mask on, it's quite hard to. Um, to tell what someone's doing if they're smiling or frowning and stuff like that or yeah got a sad face frowning you can tell on the top of the head yeah um so i don't think it will change i think we will go back to normal tv but at the moment a lot of tv is filmed with the covid restriction so there's two meters um wearing masks sanitize mm. uh, yeah the whole shabam even stuff we get in at the repair shop we have to have it for at least 72 hours before anybody can actually touch oh, it really? it goes in a bag um and then it's kind of quarantined and then it can come out into into the open and when someone's handing something over to us we're very mindful of not um not touching the same parts that they've touched and stuff like that um and if you do touch it then we kind of cut um but you sanitize and then you go back to filming yeah yeah it's interesting i mean you're right about being busy over lockdown i watched a documentary series on iplayer the other night and figured it would have nothing to do whatsoever with design and craft was called yeah. Gods of Snooker. Oh, and you yeah. were there, you were there <laughs> on it, talking about Alex Higgins and Jimmy White. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you, do you identify with these kind of outsider rebel types, I wonder? Yeah, I do, definitely. Growing up in the 70s and the 80s, um, Alex Higgins and Jimmy White were probably, well, Alex Higgins, first of all, he was a rebel amongst all rebels. He was like the punk of snooker. So he came into that game and just, he did what he did. Um, and I, 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 grew up watching all of those gods of snooker the one that i didn't really like that much was um steve davis because he just kept on winning <laughs> and it's like I, I didn't mind that he was boring but there was no personality outside of the outside of the game and 
when someone just wins all the time, you just know, like, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. But when he lost against um, Dennis Taylor, that was, whoo, that was sweet. <laughs> that was sweet. I remember that final. I had an odd thing for Terry Griffiths. I don't know what that says about me, but there you go. Uh, you know, he, he was a good player. He, he was, he, he just straight laced, yeah. He was, he was. And you've written an autobiography, Making It. Um, Guilty as charged. Yeah, how was that? <laughs> it, was, it was quite good. I'm dyslexic, so I've got the reading ability of an 11-year-old. Yeah. Um, so I had a, a, a brilliant ghostwriter that I would just talk and tell him how I was brought up and all the other bits and bobs. And then basically he put my words into a sentence. So when you read the book, it's very much, it's like me talking to you because it's, mm. it's, that's how we just did it. It was a conversation. Um, but yeah, it was quite cool. We did it during lockdown, um, over zoom. And, um, I think it took us about three, three, four months. Good. Yeah. Three months to do it, but then editing um, took about a month because we just had to tweak a few things mm. in there. Mm. Yeah, which I mean, isn't long. I mean, bear in mind if you if you were sitting down to write write a book, it would take longer than that, I would imagine. Yeah, I think with the autobiography, I, I think it's quite easy. I believe because all you're doing is talking about your history. Um, whereas if you're coming up with a story, then you have mm. to have the twist and the turns and all that kind of stuff. It's a bit more thinking process. Whereas um, all I have to do is just remember. And my memory is quite good. I think it's because of being dyslexic. I remember, I can't spell that well, but I remember how words look. Right. And that's how I write them down. Because I'm, I'm fascinated by the relationship between design and dyslexia. I mean, I have a mm. podcast I mentioned in the intro called Material Matters, where I speak to a lot of designers, yeah. makers, artists, architects. And the number of them that I've spoken to who have been diagnosed as dyslexic is, is yeah. vast. Um, yeah. One of the things they say to me is that it gives them the ability to see the world in a slightly different way than, than people without dyslexia do. I mean, is that something you can yeah. empathise with? Most definitely. I, yeah. I, I see things completely different. Sometimes I'm just walking down the road and I see a flower and I see it next to another flower and just the colours that they, they sing to me and then I get fabric that can do the same thing. So I have the two contrasting colours. Um, uh, when it comes to taking pictures or redesigning a chair, I normally do things completely different, like put the chair on the floor, don't have the chair standing up like it would normally be on its four legs, slide down, and then you just get a different view and a different feel for the chair mm. um, and any form of um, furniture, I would say. The dyslexic people that I've met, we think of things completely different. We come from a, most people will go, let's say, for instance, up the M1. The dyslexics will go round the corner and so on and so to get to let's say Leicester. Um, we take a, a, a different route, but we'll get there in the end. Um, and sometimes what we see along the way influences what we would say when we get to Leicester. I don't know yeah. why I chose Leicester. Why did I choose Leicester? Oh, it's up the M1, <laughs> isn't it? That's why. It's up it's the M1. The FA Cup. That's why. Right. <laughs> oh, uh, did they? Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's why. Uh, also, the people I've talked about dyslexia to, I mean, they, there's a common thread that they didn't get diagnosed at school and they found school very, very difficult. I mean, is that something you experienced too, I wonder? Yeah, I found school very difficult. Well, primary school was cool. Um, but when I went to secondary school, I, I didn't get diagnosed and then I suffered quite a lot of racism at um, secondary school. So that kind of stunted my um, learning. And my school, it, was, it used to be a grammar school, but then it changed. Um, and they had this kind of tier system. So you had the P's, which were the perfects, really brainy people in those um, classes or in that set. And then you had the M's. The M's were medium, um, medium learners. And then you had the L's, and I was in the L's. And the L's was full mm. of loads of dyslexic people. Um, now, when I come to think of it, none of us were diagnosed, but it was more about containing us in that environment um, rather than teaching us to get up to the M's. Um, right. They just kept us there. I had a load of substitute teachers. I mean, an obscene amount of substitute teachers. It was crazy. Um, so yeah, schooling wasn't that great for me. I mean, could you, was, was art or could you draw? Were there, were there, were, were there any subjects that you, you put a light on that you were good at, I wonder, or encouraged that? Mm -hmm. No, did the, my school wouldn't really encourage me. Um, so the, no, there was nothing really. I, I tell you, I don't even remember going to art. I remember going to woodwork once, and they stopped us from doing that because we was a bit disruptive. Um, and also, we had a, I think it was a science lesson where we used to have bunsen burners and stuff, 
And then they stopped us doing that as well. So a lot of the subjects where there was things you could either hurt someone or hurt yourself, we, we got stopped doing those kind of lessons. Um, so I think art was probably, um, you would have a pencil, sharp pencil and a blade to sharpen it or whatever. They, they just said, no, let's not let them do art. So no, uh, creativity in my secondary school, oh, let me try and think. It, it wasn't for the likes of myself who was in mm. the L's. It, mm. Yeah, we didn't have it. There was no, it was just like, right, let's contain these guys and um, make sure they get through the day without fighting or whatever. Um, yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of the reasons we were keen to involve you in the talks program is that Quest has a special installation at Artifact. Um, yeah. You're one of the organizers' ambassadors. I'm yes. kind of intrigued as to how you became involved with Quest and, and what is it that it appeals to it about you? I, I came involved with Quest because I've got a, a fairy godfather, um, Peter Ting, and he introduced me to them because he knows how passionate I am about making sure that craft is accessible. When I first got into craft, it was kind of elitist and it wasn't, um, mm -hmm. it wasn't diverse enough. Um, so with regards to Quest and the, and the ability that they have to fund people um, to train um, or retrain and all that kind of stuff, it's just like, wow. that for me is like I, I grew up in an era where and i grew up thinking this that if you can't see it you can't be it so if i'm mm. promoting quest then it's a case of the diversity will be shown and then people will be like okay i can tap into that whereas there's a lot of institutions there's a lot of organizations that are not necessarily diverse and that's the main reason why i got involved with um with quest because we need to celebrate the diversity and yeah. get people aware of what's out there for them. And if they're not aware, they can't apply. Um, I mean, do, do you think the craft and design worlds have a problem with diversity, Jay? Yeah, first and foremost. They, 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 there's no, they, they, there's a lot of institutions that do. I was chatting to a, a young person um, that does some research for me and he, oh, what did we identify yesterday? We identified there's hardly any black people doing skiing. Um, there's hardly any black people doing um, hiking, like walking yeah, up, yeah. Um, mountain climbing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a load of things, even horse riding. Um, there's a load of institutions or organisations that are not necessarily diverse. So when we look at the craft world, you even look at the design world. I remember when I started um, Out of the Dark, it was like we was the new kids on the block, and there was no one like us doing what we did, which was teaching young people how to restore and revamp old furniture. And it was like, really? There's no one doing it. And I remember chatting to Sean Sutcliffe um, from Benchmark. Yeah, and it yeah. was, we would have great discussions as into how we can include diversity, how we can allow people to say, oh, I could do that. And it's the same with me being on TV. That There hasn't been, um, from my knowledge, a, a person like myself presenting a primetime BBC show. It just hasn't happened, apart from the news. Um, but an entertainment show such as mm. the repair shop, it's like, it, it just hasn't happened. Um, and that's across the board with all of the um, stations. They're exactly the same, but things are changing. You've got someone like me on the BBC um, and there's a few shows under my belt. And, and, and basically, as I said, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So people can see it now. I'm here to influence the next generation. So people who are not even here yet. That's so it's having I'm role about. models, so it's, it's top yes. down, but presumably it's got to be bottom up as well from education and making sure that, that there's diversity from the beginning of their, their education route, I guess. Yes, there does have to be, but at the same time, not everybody's going to want to go into craft. If you look no. at um, any profession, if, if you don't see it at the moment, if you look at a young person, what they're looking at is the, t I call them the TikTok generation, where it's like people can become famous for being on YouTube or doing TikTok, and they can make millions. So that's the dream that they might be um, trying to fulfill. Whereas craft and design, it's more about understanding what your strengths are. For me, I love redesigning furniture, especially the old classic, but someone else might have a completely different slant onto it. Mm. So it's very hard, I would say, especially for education, because I know a lot of the time people throw a lot, oh, it's all down to education. It's down to the individual. And I think, Education is another institution that has just been educating people in a very Victorian kind of way, training people for the workhouses. I don't think they've caught up to the 21st century, really, yet. Yeah, yeah. When did your relationship with making start, Jay? I knew you grew up Ooh. on an estate in Hackney, but were you making things there? 
<laughs> yeah, when you're poor, you make a load of stuff. Um, you, you make do and mend. Um, so I made stuff there and the kind of like furniture you would make. I remember when I got my first place, I didn't have any furniture. So there's these old milk crates that you used to stack up. And I remember putting those on and then putting a piece of timber be between them. And that was my kind of like shelving unit. I even did that for my wardrobe. I remember making um, my bed, which was made out of pallets. I just stacked up a load of pallets, put the mattress on top and then made a headboard out of the pallets. And that was it. It was, mm. it was very, very crude. Um, but my real passion came when I was running a charity, Street Dreams, and that was working on the streets with young people. But the funding started drying up, and then I needed to teach young people how to restore and revamp old furniture as a means to keep getting my revenue in so I can continue working with those young right. people. And that's where the passion came. That was just like, wow, this is the one. Because you weren't actually a furniture restorer at that point. You kind of learned on the job. As, am I right in saying that? Or Yeah, I learned. I, I knew nothing about furniture restoration. Mm. Um, or upholstery or anything like that. So what I did is I went to the community and luckily I was living in High Wycombe at the time. And I asked, I think I went to neighborhood watch schemes. I went to WI meetings. I went to um, age concern and asked and done a presentation to those guys and said, is there anybody who's a retiree from the furniture industry that could come and teach myself and the young people what you do so then we can um, continue doing this work. And I was inundated. Mm. I had a, I think the oldest teacher we had was a 92 year old Ken in Beaconsfield and he um, was living in a care home and he taught us how to do um, caning of a chair and also rushing of a chair. Um, and that was quite cool. So I learned, yeah, definitely on the job. I, I've, I've learned from the community basically. Mm. Mm. I mean, I, quite intrigued by your background uh, mm. because we just started talking about it there, but you left school yeah. at, at 15. Yes. But later in life, you studied for a degree in criminology and philosophy at Buckinghamshire, Buckingham University. So what were you doing in between? Yeah. Uh, between the age of 15 and whenever you went to university, what, what was your life like? My life was quite mediocre. I was doing, there was, you basically, I'm someone who has got no qualifications. When I left school, I got kicked out of school, actually. Um, when I got kicked out of kicked school, out uh, fighting. Right. Got kicked out for fighting. I, I, I was fighting too much in school. Um, but but um, left school with no qualifications whatsoever and then was just doing building, labouring jobs. Any job that you didn't really need to fill in an application, those are the jobs that I did. So a mm. load of temping agencies I was working for where you just go there and then they say, okay, turn up tomorrow and um, we'll get you in a van and you'll be taking somewhere to go and earn some money. Um, so those are the jobs that I did for a very long time. A lot of building sites. I was on the building site for, God, blimey. yeah, a long time. God, blimey. It was, yeah, it was a long time I was on the building sites. Um, just doing basic labouring. Mm. And um, that was quite easy to do because you didn't need to fill in an application. As long as you could graph, they'll give you a job. And that's it. And was there a moment where you thought, I've had enough of this and I'm going to go and study at university? Yeah, it was about when I was 20, I think it was 20, 20, no, it was 29. I was 29. I was volunteering for an organization called Youth at Risk. And um, that was basically an organization that had come from America and had set up in the UK. And they worked with young people that were at risk, either leaving care or um, were involved in the criminal justice system. And they needed mentors um, with those young people. So I became a mentor there. And then that is kind of what spurred me to go to university because one of the other mentors was a teacher and she could identify that I was dyslexic. She said, oh, you should go to university. So I applied and I thought, I didn't really think about university. I thought that you didn't have to fill in any books. You didn't have to read anything or anything like that. I don't know what I was thinking, but <laughs> when I went there, the first, you get your first lecture and then they say, all right, here's your reading list. And I'm like, okay, that's quite short titles. It was just like little, I said, well, what is this? And they said, oh, those are the books you have to read. I said, well, all of those are books. There was probably about 30 books on this list. And this was just the criminology. This wasn't yeah. even philosophy. And it was like, okie dokie. So, oh, you could buy some or you can get them from the library, so on and so forth. And that's when I really identified, I had a massive problem with reading. It was like, mm. that's, <laughs> yeah. When you're reading criminology texts, it's very heavy. Um, but 
I did it with the help of the uni. They they identified that I was dyslexic and then they gave me a lot of help, a lot <clears> of support. Um, yeah, I got a scribe. I also got someone. Um, so what a scribe does is you they read you the question and then you regurgitate the question to them and then they okay. write down your answer. Um, and then I also had some software where you could scan a book into the computer and it would read it back to you. So I didn't have to read really. Right. Um, there was a load of help from the university. I mean, quite a bit. And was, was the notion when you did the criminology philosophy to go into, um, I mean, you'd already been mentoring. The, the yeah. notion was to, to do more of that. When did you discover that you had this, this gift, knack for, for being a mentor? Um, I think I found that when I was volunteering before I mm. went to university. Um, I was volunteering at a number of organizations and I was very, very successful at turning young people around. So these are young people that were either committing crime or doing some kind of um, antisocial behavior, whether it's in their home with their partner and stuff like that. Um, and I was good at turning them around. And I think that's why this teacher at the time had said to me, oh, you should go to uni to get a formal qualification because you are good, but people won't take you seriously because you don't have that qualification. Mm. You've just mm. got a a natural ability and you've got lived experience, but you don't have a formal qualification. Um, so I kind of knew that I didn't have, I didn't really have an idea of what I was going to do with the degree. And I think it came apparent when I started doing the degree, I met my ex-wife and we was talking about how we can make the world a better place and stuff and just talking and then coming up with, she, she's quite planny. So I will, <laughs> come up with these big ideas she would plan it all out and put it down into a kind of format and um yeah i luckily for me people knew about me within the community and then they just got me to do some work and that was it i started another organization which was street dreams and then from there started out the dark so it kind of just went boop, 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 boop. yeah, yeah. It, it's almost i think with dyslexic people well, my dyslexia is i don't really have a path but i find a path and the path finds me mm. So I wouldn't say I went into, some people went into criminology, says, right, I want to be a probation worker. Or I want to be a social worker. Um, I want to work in the prison service. I had none of those ideas at all. So out of the dark, furniture restoration, how did that come about mm. in the first instance? The first instance was running street dreams where we was employed by um, the police, social services, schools, parish councils, councils, you name it. Um, we was employed by them to work with young people on the street and start them doing antisocial behavior. But then um, funding started to dry up because I think a lot of councils were losing money and they needed to create a revenue to continue working with those young people. And it was a case where I would get benches or get a desk, sorry, young person would want it um, and I'll donate it to them. So I would either get a donation from BT or other big companies mm. and then they would um, give it to me either a laptop or a desk this young person had a desk. I was helping him fix it and decorate and personalize it in the way that he wanted. And then the ex-wife came out and said, look, that's a project idea. And the project idea was out of the dark, teach young people. Hold on a minute. The beauty. There we go, you're back. So you got me. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. The, the beauty of using these headphones is that sometimes the battery runs out. <laughs> Modern technology isn't that good, is it? Yeah, you need an everlasting battery that would just last you forever. I've just um, got a wire. I just use wire. <laughs> Very old-fashioned. Yeah. Old school is the best school, yeah. I tell you. Why you have no problems then? <laughs> um, but yeah, so we started out of dark and we didn't really know how it was going to work. When we originally started, it was in the back garden. I had a, um, a fence post. And it was like four tarpaulins on the top and just bought loads of furniture and got young people around um, doing it up, rubbing it down and all that kind of stuff. And I think health and safety now would have had a, not, we would have been shut down in the first five minutes mm. because it wasn't great. Um, but we moved to a premises and then it just became quite big. Yeah, really, really big. And I mean, you had this epiphany, obviously, with, with furniture restoration. Yeah. I'm kind of really interested. How, I mean, was it, was it a feeling? when you started doing this, that this, this is it, this is, I found my, my thing. I, I, I think I, well, to tell them the truth, I didn't feel it at first. I right. thought people buying secondhand furniture, who's going to want secondhand furniture? Because in the industry, the majority of people who was buying secondhand furniture were 
people that are on low incomes. Um, so coming out of prison or coming out of the caring system that they went and bought um, cheaper furniture. So it, it only dawned on to me that this would be successful when we had a piece of furniture in a magazine in Germany, if I remember rightly, and three people tried to buy it at the same time. It was just like, wow, this, and I remember wrapping up this piece, it was a sideboard actually. I remember wrapping it up and the guy was coming to pick it up to take it to Germany. And it was like, there's something in this. Um, and then we continued buying loads of furniture. And at the time you could buy Urco, G plan parking, you could mm. buy that stuff for next to nothing. Mm. I remember buying Urco for like six pounds fifty. Um, and it was cheap, it, it, unbelievably cheap. But um that's when it felt like this is something. It didn't feel like it at the beginning because I just thought, why are we doing this? Because the people you're selling furniture to are the people you're supporting. Whereas the people you need to sell the furniture furniture to are the ones that I thought wouldn't buy it. And they're the ones that will make us sustainable. Yeah. So making us sustainable was a was a big thing for me because of the lack of funding with regards to um, the street dream. It was like, right, we have to control our own revenue. So we needed that revenue coming in to continue working with these guys and girls. So yeah, and it and it just took off. It was like, wow. <laughs> Well, I love that description that you give, but with, for, to encourage the kids to take part in the first instance of, of rather than saying you're going to restore furniture, saying you can yeah. make money from nothing here, which is, I think is a really intriguing way of looking at it. Yeah, I think when you're, when you're dealing with, oh, sorry about that, this should be on airplane mode. I don't know why it does that. That's some <laughs> one technology again. Um, but when you're working with, let's say, urban young people, um, they are driven by money. Um, even me, when I was growing up in the poor side of town, it's like you're driven by the, the kind of illusion of money, the, the kind of things that you think it brings you, it brings you happiness and all that kind of stuff. So if I was to go to them and explain to them about restoration, they'd be like, I don't want to do that. That's mm. quite boring. That's old fuddy did stuff. But if you say to them, I'm going to teach you how to make money from nothing, they're like, okay, I'm listening to you now. And then you show them there's a chair, that they might have sat on or they've, they've kicked it about and it's broken. And they say, see that chair over there? We're going to turn that into 175 pounds. And they're like, what? And that's when they're really open and mm. engaged. But along that process of showing them, look, I'm going to show you how to take the chair apart, glue it back together, restore it, put some fabric on there, either paint it, take a picture and try to get it into certain magazines, um, work with certain bloggers or influencers, and then, like you're able to sell that item. You have to make it desirable because at the moment where it is and what it is, it's not desirable, but that's what we're going to do. And along the way, the young people then learn that they are desirable because if they've gone through school and they said they had the same experience as me, like not being recognized as dyslexic and feeling like they're inadequate to allow them to feel that they are a desirable person because of the skills that they've got in them, because the skills that we've taught them that's what we're all about because yeah, then it yeah. kind of stops that cycle um and it's quite interesting to see young people get turned on by furniture and it's turned on in the sense of the possibility of change like you can see something that's knackered it might not even have a leg and then you find a leg from another chair glue it all together restore it put some foam on there and um do some fabric really make it look beautiful and then it sells they just like, woo, I did that. <laughs> so someone wanted what I created. And that is probably the best feeling you can ever have, um, I think. And I mean, you have your company, J and Co now. Yes. Uh, how would you describe your aesthetic? Oh, I would say it's happy furniture. It's happy, um, bespoke and statement furniture. It's something where it creates a discussion. A lot of the stuff that I do at J&Co is not necessarily traditional. It's more doing things by a mistake that I've made along the way and just says, mm. all right, that looks quite cool. But it does rub people up the wrong way. A lot of people, I remember when I first started painting one leg, a lot of people were like, one leg, why haven't you finished the chair? Um, and that came about in two kind of ways. One, where there was a young person who used to work with us out of the dark and he used to paint a chair always painted a chair and missed out a leg always and he's like oh chair's finished i'm like no you're not finished 
you haven't done all the legs. No, no, I've done them all. <laughs> like, and he just couldn't get his head round. And he would always miss the one right at the back on the right hand side, if you're looking at the chair. And then another time, um, which confirmed it for me, I was working on a chair and I think I was doing a chair for money for nothing. And I was painting this chair and I, I had only painted the front leg. And then I was on the phone, was talking. And I was like, wow, that looks quite cool. And it was an Urko stick back chair. And what happens with the stick back and what I identified, and this is where the dyslexic brain comes in, that just painting one leg then made you look at all the different components, how they were put together. And it really um, emphasized the design in a way that I've never seen. And it, mm. it's probably only me that sees that, but I think that's what it does. It really gets you to look at it. Um, and then dripping paint, which I do again, that came about where I was um, working on a chair and the paint pot fell over. I was just about to tidy it up. And how it was dripping down, it was a bit like an ice cream in the summer in the 70s and 80s where it was just dripping down there and you could see it on a kid's hand. That's what it reminded me of. So I just said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. I think that looks quite cool. So I just started doing dripping paint. <laughs> mm. I, mean, I hope you don't mind me asking about this, Jay, because in, in terms yeah. of the kind of arc of your life, there yeah. was this period where out of the dark lost funding, your marriage broke down yes. and you ended up Everything. living in a car outside McDonald's, mm. I think, for a week. Um, yeah, in a retail park, yeah. Yeah, how did you, how did you find your way out of that? Um, well, first of all, I found my way into it. But yeah, I have to explain how I found my way out of it. I have to explain how I found myself into it. I found myself into it because I was a person in the community that everybody looked up to. And when I fell down, um, where everything could flop for me, I couldn't go to the people that I was supporting. It was kind of like a, a role reversal. So the only thing I could do was just get in the car and just drive. Um, I, I think the way that I came out of it was to show my vulnerability, show my vulnerability to another man. Um, so crying in front of someone allowed me to just feel like, you, you, I felt quite naked by, by, by crying. It just like, it stripped me of every facade that I had put up being a strong man in the, in the poor side of town, being a person that was defending myself against racists. Mm. It's just like, boom. and then when you cry, it's like, wow, all of it goes. Sorry, all of it goes. Um, and that's how I got out of it, by crying. And then I, I received support from family and community members um, that are now family to me because they just supported me along that way. And um, yeah, it's, it's a very weird, sometimes I reflect upon it and it's very weird to think of where I was, let's say six years ago to where I am now. Mm. And it's like, you couldn't even, what's the word? If you told someone my story, they would say, look, tone it down. If you was going to make a film about my story, they would say, tone it down by about 25, 30%. No one can live a life like that. That's impossible. Um, but yeah, I have. And even I get a little bit shocked out with regards to <laughs> the life that I've lived and where I am now. It's it kind of like, you look at yourself and think, hold on, I'm on telly. I'm presenting a show that's going out to, seven million people then you filmed another one i have a production company i'm doing furniture i'm mentoring people um it's just like really it's it, it's kind of it, it blows my mind sometimes mm. just blows mm. it i mean the, the tv career came out of a film that the guardian uh, shot uh, about That's you right. and out of the dark right and yeah. i think you did money for nothing was your first show initially um i mean did you see yeah. tv becoming a career no, I didn't. I, I, to tell the truth, I did. The only time I saw TV becoming a career was, I think, last year um, during lockdown. That I realised, okay, there is something about me um, that is. Thank you, explain it. It's very needed on TV at the moment. So you need to have different voices. You need to show diversity. So you, if you have someone like me, um, six foot three black guy from council estate, gold tooth doing a kind of um, a craft show or a, a repairing show, which is very middle England. Mm. Um, it's, it's a bit like, oh, hold on. That doesn't fit, but it does fit because it's just normal. We're all people at the end of the day. So it's not like I don't belong there, 
it's a case of you do belong there and you have the empathy because of the community work I've done. You have the way to um, speak to people and be aware of the, the emotional kind of intelligence I've got. It's just like, bam, it's on it. So that's what you need on a show like that. And then it's a case of I do something like Money for Nothing or other shows that I'm doing. As I said, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So they'll put me wherever they can put me and wherever it fits. The show that I've just finished filming takes me right back to my original roots of how I got into TV work. So it's called Jay's Workshop. And it's basically, um, I have three expert makers, furniture makers, and they all have two apprentice seats. So in total, there's about nine people and including myself, there's 10 of us. So I go into the community or I, um, the community members come to me and they talk to me about someone in the community who's done some brilliant work, either during COVID or even before that. And what I then do is set my team a task to make that person an individual item for them. And um, then we give it to them. We, we surprise them with this item. <laughs> and it's quite so emotional. It, I'm, guessing there's, I'm guessing there's some tears in there somewhere. There is some tears in there, but the, the stories are just, I, I think for a long time, we haven't celebrated the uncelebrated. It's almost as if we have become bombarded with this kind of celebrity lifestyle. And every celebrity is like the pinnacle. Everybody wants to be like that person. And I, I see things as a dyslexic slightly different. I like to celebrate the uncelebrated. The people that are out there in our community that are doing some really groundbreaking work, saving lives and supporting people, those are the people we should be celebrating. Um, because a celebrity getting another, let's say, Lamborghini or something like that and going to Dubai, I'm not really interested in that. <laughs> but someone saving someone's life or someone looking after the older generation, making sure people have food um, on the table, um, people fleeing domestic violence and um, people supporting them with all of the clothing or whatever they may need. Those are the people. So I'm, yeah. I'm basically a community worker that they put in front of a camera. That's all I am. Um, well, it'd, be, it'd be fascinating to see whether COVID has changed attitudes when we eventually all come out of it. You, you sense that it might have, but it may all just go back to the same as it was. Who knows? I, I think it might go back to the same, but there will be a group of people that similar to the group of people that started watching a repair shop when it was on BBC two, that will start this trend and hopefully mm. with jay's workshop we should keep that going because we were celebrating the nurses every thursday we was doing it we was clapping and this is something we should be doing all of the time we, there's people in our community who are doing some brilliant work so let's let's celebrate them let's make them feel like what you're doing is valid and we value you yeah i mean the repair shop which we yes. kind of alluded to, we haven't really talked about in any depth. <laughs> seven million viewers or something, something along those lines. I mean, what do you yes, put that seven. down to? There's quite a few things it's down to. So it's down to community, love, um, craft, and people just wanting to feel good. When you, when you think about the show, it has so many different elements. You have a story that's something, well, you have an item, first of all, that someone's brought in, and then they talk about the story unravel it and tell us about the history of this item and then you have this kind of um expert team that are just to die for um i call them my family now my tv family that can repair and fix anything and then we give it back to that person and then when you give it back to them you almost see that person either go small again go back to that five-year-old child or whatever or you just see them light up with the memories come flooding back to how it used to look and the person who gave it to them or who it's linked to. And that is basically, that's it. It's, it, there's so many things in the repair shop that you can relate to. People watch it for all different reasons. Some mm. people watch it for the craft and they want to see how everything's fixed. Some people watch it for the story. Some people watch it just for how a community has come together and just working to support someone we don't even know. Um, it's just that they've got this item. It needs to be repaired. It's kind of like the, I'm going to show my age here. It's kind of like the bag puss of, um, for uh, grown ups. It's the yeah, grown up yeah. version of, do you remember bag puss? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I, I'm it's showing my age mice. now as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the little mice there just fixing. Those are the experts. And then like, I'm bag yeah. puss. That's kind of what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you think the general public is taking skill and repair more seriously now as a result of the show? Yeah. Most definitely. Um, the amount of people that I get contacting me on a daily basis, sometimes hourly basis, um, I think skill, craft, and restoration, everything is just being highlighted. 
and it's been highlighted in a way where we, we have become a consumer society. And when you come a consumer society, you buy something broke, throw it away. Whereas back in the day, I remember growing up, you had a repair shop mm. on every high street. You had a guy that would come around and he would sharpen your knives and then would have this big stone and that would be it. But um, lockdown has allowed us to just pause, have a look at our houses, see what we can do ourselves. And then also there's some people who haven't got the money to then go out and buy a new house or buy new things in there. Um, they've become very resourceful. So these shows have like just grown because everybody wants to learn, how can I do it myself? And um, yeah, I think with Quest, you've got um, Heritage Craft Association, you've got the Princess Foundation. You have a number of organizations now that are just saying, look, this is what we can do. And this is what you can do if you have the right training. Uh, so yeah, I think there's a first for it. Yeah, and it's gonna come back in a very strong way. It already has, and it's gonna come back even stronger. That make do and men culture that we had from the 1950s onwards um, is going to come back. Well, I hope so. I hope so. Jay, yeah. our time is nearly up. Um, okay. So final <laughs> question. Um, plans for the future. You've got a new TV show. You've got the book. Is, is there anything else we should know about? Um, the only thing I think the, the production company, I, most of the shows that I'm going to be doing now are based around community. Um, so the repair shop has just been commissioned for the next three years. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm just working and working and working. One thing I do need to do though, is I need to get away more. I need to, I know cause of COVID, like no one's allowed to go anywhere unless you go. I think it's Portugal is the place. Yes. That, All the Falkland yeah. Islands, which, which is lovely this time of year. I hear. See, there you go. So, <laughs> so those are the two destinations I could go to. Um, I would prefer to go to Barbados at the moment, but I have to wait. <laughs> so that's the only thing I think I'll keep on working on to the government say like, all of the countries uh, have got the green light and then you can go forward. So there's a lot of shows that I'm doing. Um, yeah, quite a lot. So, so you're, you're going to cross the TV screens a lot soon is, is what, we're, what we're discovering. Yeah, and I apologise now. Um, it's just <laughs> that, it, it, as I said, people, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And obviously, me being me, they want me to be in certain shows so people can see that, oh, it is a possibility. I can do that type of stuff. Um, so yeah, um, sorry, people. If you got bored of me, you're going to get even more bored because it's, it's, there's a load of a load of shows coming out. <laughs> well, brilliant, Jay. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You take care now. Uh, thank you, and um, thank you very much for listening, everybody, and watching. Uh, do remember that Artifact is running from the 22nd to the 29th of June at London's Design Centre Chelsea Harbour. Do pop along. Thanks very much.